Welcome, my name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity Smart Data webinar series with host Adrian Bowles. Today, Adrian will discuss knowledge as a service, an introduction to the emerging pre-built knowledge market. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag SmartData. Data. If you'd like to chat with us and with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right-hand corner for that feature. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Adrian Bowles. Adrian is an industry analyst and recovering academic, providing research and advisory services for buyers, sellers, and investors in emerging technology markets. His coverage areas include cognitive Cognitive Computing, Big Data Analytics, the Internet of Things, and Cloud Computing. Adrian co-authored Cognitive, Cognitive, I can say that today, Cognitive <laughs> Computing and Big Data Analytics, published by Wiley in 2015, and is currently writing a book on the business and societal impact of these emerging technologies. Adrian earned his BA in Psychology and MS in Computer Science from SUNY Binghamton, and his PhD in Computer Science from Northwestern University. And with that, Adrian, I'm going to turn it over to you. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Computer sinus. I think that's the first time I've ever that. That, so, uh, My tongue is just tied today. Oh. Well, it's too bad that our topic today <laughs> isn't, natu isn't natural language processing. Or <laughs> field day. Indeed. <laughs> well, thank you, Shannon. As always, it's good to be here. And I'm looking forward to having a lively discussion at the end, so I guess I better get started with the beginning. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so as Shannon said, I wanna talk about knowledge as a service, or more broadly, the idea of prepackaged knowledge uh, as a commodity to be bought and sold for those that are developing uh, software solutions, and in particular, cognitive solutions. So let me give you a quick overview, if I can Oh, uh, let's see, this is where it's just sitting here and I've lost my cursor. There we go. So I'm gonna spend uh, a few minutes on the, the nature of the problem that we're solving with pre-built knowledge and the types of uh, issues that we need to look at. Then uh, talk about the idea of designing systems with knowledge or data in mind. Then we get into kind of the meat of it, how, what are the available sources out there and how do you get to them? And then a few words on getting started before we go into the Q&A. So let's dive right in. What is the problem that we're solving with pre-built data or pre-built knowledge? Going back to uh, my traditional overview of the world of AI and cognitive, um, what I've said for the last couple of years is that uh, when I look at modern AI, the way things are today versus a few years ago when I got started, um, we're still trying to solve some of the same problems uh, in terms of uh, problem solving, natural language processing. There you go, Shannon, that one's for you. Um, machine learning and all that good stuff, that, that all fits in classic AI. But what has changed in the last two decades, and certainly in the last uh, decade, the, the pace is speeding up, is that we seem to be focused a lot on big data and deep learning, and the two are intertwined. You really need, for most types of uh, deep machine learning, um, a lot more data than we used in the past. And so what we want to look at today is how that impacts the way we design systems, but how do we get access to data so that we don't have to do everything ourselves? Um, so, in my view of the, the world, we've sort of got this, uh, the red circle there, which is the heart of cognitive computing systems, where we have understanding, reasoning, and learning. And, and for context here, what I'm showing outside uh, with the, uh, the shaded arrows are the inputs and outputs to our system. So we're getting input, uh, which may be data. Uh, well, it's all data, but it, it may be coming in the form of uh, human input in natural language or gestures or uh, tracking uh, people's emotions based on audio signals, et cetera. 
or it's coming from machines. So it could be coming from sensors from the IoT systems. Um, and on the output side, obviously, we, we may have some output for people or for machines. But that blue circle between the I.O. and the, uh, the cognitive red circle, data management, often gets uh, short shrift when we're talking about these systems. And that's really what I want to focus on today, which is uh, what is the data that's coming in? What are the different alternatives? And how do we, uh, how do we get them? How do we process them? And uh, perhaps how do we design systems with the data in mind? So if I take the same diagram and try and change the scale a little bit, really what's happened is I've moved some things like the idea of uh, concepts and emotions and meaning and intent into this data management level and out of the cognitive portion. Uh, the actual border is, uh, is a lot fuzzier than I show it here. But the idea is that we need to be able to uh, store a lot of data about the problem domains we're working with. And sometimes that's going to be done before we get into this uh, understanding and, and reasoning part. And by that I mean we want to be able to get a lot of data sources that are already organized in a way that we can use them. And so today we're going to look at uh, some of the considerations uh, and how we classify the data and then what are the sources and how can we actually acquire or procure data uh, that allows us to do the interesting stuff. And I say that with all due respect to the folks that think that procuring and, and manipulating the data is the interesting stuff. But the actual uh, cognition, if you will, or the pseudo-cognition within the understanding, reasoning, and learning loop. So let's look at the way the data is going to be stored so that we can actually um, represent not just data, but some meaning associated with the data. And I'm generally pretty casual in this sort of a, a chat about the distinction between data and knowledge, but we'll, we'll look at um, sort of how data gets refined to be knowledge and uh, some of the important considerations when we're choosing data sources. So uh, another part of the, the reason for this being important is that uh, historically, when we built systems that had some semblance or some um, attempt at intelligence, the fundamental approach was to use a lot of the human intelligence of the system designer and code that into uh, the application so that it could handle uh, the data that we were, uh, we were looking at. And, Back in my days as a computer science professor, I always said that you could tell if you gave the same uh, programming assignment to a freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior, you could tell by their code what level they were at because a freshman would write something that would solve the problem just for the test data you gave them. Um, a sophomore would try to show off perhaps and write uh, code that would solve every problem in the world, including the one that you asked for. But by the time you got a little more mature, you realized that the importance was to solve for the broad class of data that the application was supposed to solve for, make it robust, and not do much more than that, because anything adds complexity. So if you look at this uh, chart here going left to right, in the early days, we were really focused on uh, kind of being very smart with what we put in the application. Now, with uh, machine learning, and in particular with deep learning, we can let the data direct the activities of the application. So it doesn't mean that uh, the system doesn't have to have intelligence or have to have uh, logic. It just means that we're putting a lot more responsibility, if you will, on the data itself. And so the data has to be uh, 
pre-processed or be organized in a way that it will allow the system to act intelligently. So the significance of the data, uh, the complexity of the data, the completeness of the data, if you will, uh, is a lot more important today, I would say, than it was just a few years ago. So as we get into different uh, domains and tasks, the nature of the data also changes. And this is actually from uh, something that we're publishing, uh, I believe, next week with um, Aragon Research on chatbots. The idea is that the data that we're going to be dealing with, as it gets more specific, if, if I'm dealing with something, I'm trying to build a system that handles all of healthcare versus just pharma, uh, it's a completely different uh, set of requirements for the data. And if I'm trying to make a system that will uh, handle any type of input, start to get up towards uh, AGI or artificial general intelligence, that's a whole different set of constraints on the data. Usually kind of the sweet spot for a chatbot is down in the lower left. You want to have something that's uh, tightly defined in terms of tasks and domain. But the types of systems that we were looking at today would go more towards the middle. I want to be able to build systems that will handle more general tasks or more general uh, domains. And so we want to get past the, uh, the, the chatbot level of data and look at what are the options for us for data sources? Just a couple more uh, thoughts on organizing this data. And I'm going to uh, just make the, the broad statement that I think uh, really when we're building applications today, I certainly go along with the uh, semantic web um, approach where any data that we use should have semantic attributes or, or meaning associated with it. And it doesn't mean that everything is going to be uh, completely specified, but using the uh, OWL, for example, the, the web ontology language, uh, enables us to specify more clearly uh, the meaning of data in a way that data can be linked across data sets and across applications. And so as we look at data sources, one of the things we want to look at is uh, how much data, how much um, metadata or contextual data or semantic information uh, is associated with it or available with it so that it can be used in multiple contexts. And that gets to what I was uh, starting to allude to at the beginning in terms of really um, imbuing, if you will, the data in the data set uh, with attributes that you might associate with knowledge. So uh, things have meaning, and some of the meaning is supported in the data set by the way it's organized or by the way it's specified. And this is something that uh, if you've been with us for the last year or two on uh, on this series, I've alluded to this uh, framework in the past. I'm a very firm believer that one of the dumbest uh, things we've done in terms of terminology is to make a distinction between structured and unstructured data. So I try not to use those terms uh, because, frankly, if it's not structured, if there is no structure, uh, then to me it's not data, it's noise. And so when we look at uh, different uh, data sources or different approaches to capturing data, really what I want to look at is kind of the degree of difficulty, if you will, in identifying the structure so that it can be used in a particular application. And just very quickly to, to sort of justify that, if you say something that is unstructured, it means that it is not structured. Very simple. Uh, it's not like flammable and inflammable in, uh, in English. But data, uh, if we're ever going to be able to use something, it has to have structure. It's just a question of how hard it is to find. If you go on the beach and you find uh, a gold bar on the sand, it's treasure. 
well, it's still treasure if it's covered by a few grains of sand, or it's still treasure if it's uh, deeply buried. Something has structure just because it's not obvious, just because we have to go through maybe six layers of, uh, of uh, deep learning um, algorithm to identify the edges and the shape and then what it, what it actually is. To me, that's meaningless. So for all of the uh, sources that we look at, when the uh, providers talk about structured versus unstructured or finding structure, uh, finding some meaning in uh, a Wikipedia article, just think of it in these terms. That it's, it's, it's either something that's at the surface and that's like the gold bar that's actually on the sand. You can see it, it's obvious. Uh, typically, we use that to mean something that was written for machine consumption versus human consumption, but uh, it really shouldn't matter uh, when we're looking at these sources because for any source that can be used as data, there is a process that will transform it or identify that. So I'm going to say, uh, as we're looking at these sources, it, I'll try and point out when things are organized uh, as taxonomies, as sort of a hierarchical representation so that uh, we don't just have a list of, maybe it's a data set, if you're interested in uh, doing some insurance calculations, you may find a data set of all the registered vehicles in a particular state. Well, just having a list of all the vehicles that doesn't include um, information about how they fit in the world of vehicles is not particularly interesting. That's data at, at its most raw form. It's uh, something that I, I would think of as uh, no level of abstraction. It's, um, well, it's one level above just, uh, just letters. But if we can organize that data into a taxonomy as a starting point, it's going to be a lot more useful. And then, uh, again, sort of a, a loose definition here, we want to go a little further and have an ontology that actually f specifies the definitions and the attributes of the entities within the domain. And the domain here is what we're looking at so that when we're looking at data sources, we want to be able to get them um, properly organized to make the most use out of it. I mean, there will be certainly instances where we'll look at uh, uh, fairly raw data and it'll be up to us to, to discover the meaning. But uh, in general, I'm going to look and, and say we'll give uh, extra points, if you will, to things that are organized like this. So I'm going to point out a couple of things now and then again at the end in terms of things to watch out for. One of the issues, uh, even when you're building systems yourself and, and you have control over the data, is to make a distinction in your logic between things that you know and things that you believe. And it's a, a very big difference, um, I think, in the way that these need to be handled. And specifically, uh, if it's something that is truth, it's immutable, it shouldn't change. If it's something that's a belief, then we need to have uh, data attributes associated with it that will let us know um, temporally and perhaps spatially when that belief was held to be valid. And just as a, a starting point here, um, I use the, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders from the American Psychiatric Association. That was my background um, to show how the definition of autism has changed or has evolved over the last few uh, releases of the DSM. So we're now at DSM-5, came out in 2013. We have a spectrum. Uh, talk about uh, someone being on the spectrum. There's a, a list of uh, attributes that are used to define the behavior that defines membership in that set of being on the autism spectrum. Well, human behavior hasn't really changed between DSM-3, 4, and 5, 
but where people are classified uh, has changed. And so it's a question of what is what is truth. And if you give, uh, if you're trying to use data, uh, let's say case data on an individual and trying to uh, categorize them using the DSM uh, classification scheme, then it's very important to know when the diagnosis took place because you're gonna get different classification for the same symptoms based on the assumptions that were in place for the different um, the different releases, if you will. And it may seem like I, I belabor this point, but it's really important um, to have that temporal information because uh, there are things that are, are, as I say, universal and they shouldn't change. Uh, hopefully mathematics, for example, we may have new discoveries. Um, physics, the things in the periodic table, we may find new elements, but the things that are there, we know the organization. But a lot of what we capture in systems, uh, they're gonna be uh, cognitive systems, are subject to interpretation and that involves over time, and so the time element needs to be part of the data stream. And the last thing um, on this, this part in terms of preparing um, to bring in data streams from different sources is to recognize that today, a lot of the applications that we're gonna be building will need to integrate uh, a combination of um, historical data and current data to make predictions, whether we're dealing with uh, relatively straightforward predictive analytics or whether we're going into uh, some uh, deeper logical systems, for example. Usually uh, in a complex environment, we're dealing with a combination of both, both types of data. And the current data may be relatively slow moving. We'll see an example of that or it may be high speed streaming data. And so when we're looking at the available sources, it's important to understand whether we're going to be able to use everything or whether we're going to sample. And uh, you know, what are the implications of that? I was speaking with a, a uh, firm yesterday that's doing political um, polling and they're doing it 100% based on Twitter. And to me, there's an issue there because they have historical data, which includes things other than Twitter, but their current data is only Twitter. And even if you use 100% um, of the tweets on a particular topic, that still represents only a, it represents the entire population of people who use Twitter, which is a subset or a sample of the people who vote. So we need to be able to look at the sources and how they're created and how we're going to be able to integrate them. We're not gonna have time today to talk about specific um, products for doing the integration, but maybe we'll cover that another time or if you're interested, just reach out and, and email me about it. So the question um, that I often raise when people are talking about uh, going out and, and getting new data sources is, do you need to start by identifying need for specific data or are you looking for new opportunities and you wanna find out what's out there and then find new ways to use them? And so either way, I think it's important to, to sort of map out the characteristics of the data that you're going to need. And I do it on these two dimensions. One is how fast the values change, that's the rate of change. Are we dealing with something that's relatively static uh, it doesn't need to be com completely static. Um, it can be slow change versus something that's high frequency change. And then how specific is the domain? And that's a level of abstraction. The, the two key things in computer science are always how abstract can we get because abstraction is power and how long can we delay binding to a decision? And that really uh, ties to the rate of change. So natural language, for example, if we're gonna take in a data set that is 
that gives us a lot of information in natural language or about natural language. If uh, we stick to the one that I, I know best for myself is uh, English. English changes. It's not completely static. There are new words added. There are new meanings added. But uh, compared to the weather, the language is fairly stable. And if you take the totality of the language, then it's, it's pretty general. You can describe uh, pretty much anything that we would want to describe in English versus uh, restricting the language to a specific domain, a specific subset, or restricting the meaning to a specific subset. You can still use the entire uh, vocabulary, if you will. You can still use the, uh, all the words in the language, but they'll have very specific meanings um, within a domain like medicine. If we talk about temperature, just in the abstract, the, the word temperature has a lot of different uh, different implications uh, depending on how it's used, but if it's used in a patient chart, uh, then there's really only one meaning. We're kind of narrowing that down, and that doesn't change very often. So when I have uh, APA diagnostics, it's not that they don't change, but it takes years uh, between the additions versus something that's streaming, something that uh, um, the weather changes fairly frequently. Yes, stock prices change faster than the weather. And if you combine that, when we start to look at uh, what sources are out there, you can find different opportunities for the data depending on where the data fit on this chart. I always turn off my phones. But that's one that's not even connected. Sorry about that. All right, so uh, the answer to the question, do you determine the need or identify the resources first? I say it depends on the application. There are times when you're going to build an application, you know what it is, it's in your domain, you want to create some new functionality. But uh, I'm going to encourage you, certainly uh, at the end here, to look around and find new sources of data and find new uses for existing sources of data that are now much easier for you to get. So why are we using pre-built knowledge? We uh, pick up the pace a little bit here. Uh, it, it's simple. If you can get that the knowledge that's already been packaged and put in a form that's usable to you, uh, you still want to do some tailoring, obviously, uh, so that it, it fits your application, but it's going to save you time, money, and create something, um, bring something to market faster. So the example here is from uh, Sitecorp down in Texas. That's been working on uh, a model of um, the world's knowledge, if you will, all together, for about 30 years. And going into what they have with Open Site, is a platform where you can get access to this uh, full um, full representation, if you will. So you can uh, read. I'm not going to go through all the the, uh, the numbers there, but it's an ontology that is an attempt to capture human consensus on the meaning of words and the relationships between them. So. We've got uh, hundreds of thousands of terms, uh, triples and RDF, and all of the uh, semantic information that I was talking about has already been captured. So as a starting point, if you were to go in and map out your data needs and say, all right, I need to be able to have some common sense um, understanding of the English language so that when I'm doing my, my uh, natural language uh, understanding, this, this is one of the places that you could go to get that data source that's already been uh, validated to some extent uh, in, in terms of their process for capturing the meaning. To me, it's very similar to the way the um, OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, was developed by getting a large population to contribute meaning based on word usage. And so this is a project that's been around for decades and is now being uh, made available to the public. 
we use pre-built knowledge in um, more specific applications. So in the earlier chart, this would be something that's uh, high on the um, specificity. It, it's not generalized and it's um, very task specific and domain specific. And I'm just using the example from IBM for Watson Conversation Virtual Agent, where if you're working with a system and you're trying to build um, an account management system, for example, you can use uh, the pre-built knowledge that they package with their application, with their functionality uh, via APIs, so that you're not spending your time um, creating things for uh, a customer calling in and wanting to do an email change, for example. It's something that's been done. It's been done a million times. You can just package that. And what we want to look at uh, for the remainder of the time is things that uh, are at, at either extreme like this, this, this being a task-specific, domain-specific set, or um, the, the PSYCHOR work, which is a much more general use of English, and see that right now, uh, in the last several years, things have opened up to the point where it's really easy and in general, really inexpensive to get access to the data that would have been impossible or um, impossibly expensive just a few years ago. And that's where we're going with this. So how do we procure the data? And I'm gonna look at uh, sort of four approaches uh, and which one or combination you choose is gonna depend on the application itself. But this is trying to get you to think in terms of okay, if I know what I need, I can see if any combination of these four sources will help me. And if I don't know what I need and I'm trying to uh, create something innovative within my industry, let me look at what's out there that I can either acquire or repurpose. So with that in mind, I'm gonna start with Iago, yet another great ontology. Uh, there's no shortage even when we go to four letters of great terms here. So Iago is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, is a joint project of the Max Planck Institute and the Telecom Paris Tech University. Bring this one out uh, first. It's um, open source. And this is uh, information from, from their uh, development site. Semantic knowledge base derived from Wikipedia, WordNet, and GeoNames. Now, Wikipedia is obviously a great source for a lot of things. There's obviously stuff in Wikipedia that is wrong. Um, there's more that's right with it than there is wrong, is the way I would put it. But Wikipedia is something that actually changes fairly rapidly, and particularly when there's a, a world event um, it changes a lot faster than the old encyclopedias that it, it tends to replace. So this is an ontology that's derived from Wikipedia and WordNet, and I'll, I'll mention WordNet in more detail in a minute, um, that has over 10 million entities. And what I like about it, um, besides the fact that it's, it's quite comprehensive and a lot of people that are um, involved in this, is that facts can also um, have associated with them, or an entity, a temporal and a spatial dimension. So uh, as I was speaking about before, you know, there are things that apply um, within a time range. You know, uh, if you look at um, dietary restrictions, for example, the, what we think is safe today may not be what we think is safe tomorrow, but um, what we think today is definitely not what we thought just a few years ago. And so it, it's good to know um, where something applies in terms of truth or belief and when. Uh, Yago also has a really nice um, graph browser. I mean, you can sort for things um, by region, uh, by time, and it's a great starting Place. Uh, it was a lot of the um, the things that are in there were used actually 
um, by the original IBM Watson team when they were building the knowledge base to play Jeopardy. Uh, you know, finding those relationships, uh, it's, it's good to have a pre-built solution to build, to use as a starting point. DBpedia, the goal of the DBpedia is to extract structured data, and I put it in quotes, I hate the term, uh, from Wikipedia. And again, the idea here is, and this is from their, uh, their entry, um, it's open source, you can get access to it. It describes the entities using the ontology. What it's, what it's trying to do is provide some um, organizational properties to the raw data that's available in Wikipedia. So instead of you trying to build something that's going to scan all of Wikipedia um, and then process that, if you start with the DBpedia um, or, or Yago, someone else has done the work of building that framework, building that ontology, building those relationships, and doing the mapping. And so that will save a lot of time. Uh, as we'll see, though, there are some issues because you want to make sure that the assumptions that are being used in these sources are consistent with your own. And there are a couple of ex um, examples at the end uh, that I'll use as uh, kind of cautionary tales. Uh, WordNet was uh, mentioned earlier, just a, another um, plug for WordNet as an ongoing project uh, based out of Princeton that has already um, organized the English language to a, a large extent in a way that it makes it much easier to build systems that um, read and interpret natural language. So when we talk about natural language processing, we break it up into natural language understanding and natural language generation. Uh, in terms of the understanding, a lot of what you need to do if you're going to build a system, maybe it's a question answering system or a diagnostic system, that first part, first step of um, breaking it out into the language and then storing it in a way that you're going to be able to use it if you use the meanings that have been um, adopted by things like uh, the team that's building WordNet or uh, Sitecorp, then again, it's, it's a huge time savings. You can build systems today far quicker and spend your time on the differentiating value that you have based on your interpretation um, of that higher level meaning. As I said, the more abstract you get, the more powerful you get. This has taken the raw data, which is very concrete, it comes in in terms of um, uh, characters, characters, words, sentences. You start to do your parsing and then your uh, semantic analysis. But once you've done the syntactic analysis, if you're having a, a raw data stream of um, text, you only do that simple part, and there are plenty of open source uh, parsers out there to do that for you. Then the next step here in terms of understanding is done if you're uh, using one of these um, ontologies. So how do you do it in practice? You know, you can build um, your system pretty much from scratch, but now the, the types, of, types of data streams that I've been talking about, uh, which are relatively static because they are the, the language based, you know, those are all available as, um, as open source uh, feeds. I'm going to just go through uh, the representative sets from three of the larger players, larger commercial players, who have a vested interest in getting you to use their cloud services. And as something that uh, it's kind of like the telephone carriers that love to have you um, by different types of content because it uses the minutes or uh, however you're being metered. Here uh, for AWS is, is one of the examples. These are the public data sets 
that you can get just by uh, if you're building your system on AWS. And so it has everything from you know machine learning um, uh, data sets to public data sets on, on banking to geospatial data sets. These are all uh, free. They're all available to you, whatever sort of app you're building, as ongoing uh, data sets. And I will note that uh, some of those, uh, like NASA um, data sets or, uh, or EPA risk screening indicators, these are things that uh, I'll, I'll describe um, more generally as open data from government and have a, just a minute on that. But basically, to build a system today, uh, if you identify the nature of the data that you need, one of the public cloud providers will probably give you access to it. So this is a representative set from AWS, from Google with the Google uh, Cloud Platform. On the left, uh, the commercial data sets, it's a, a, set, of, um, a set of data sets that uh, you can get through Google that are fee-based, so Dow Jones, uh, AccuWeather, uh, versus the one on, on the right, they're big query data sets that are in general um, free. And uh, you'll see again, a lot of those include uh, government data or open data from governments. So uh, New York City 311 service requests, it's a public database that you could get directly from uh, the New York City uh, government site or you can get it through Google and some of the other uh, cloud providers. Microsoft, another one. Um, a lot of the government agency data, and uh, take it from the, uh, the federal to the state to the New York City taxi data. Uh, I think it's fascinating that uh, you can get taxi trip records uh, for free. It comes from New York City and one of the ways you can get it uh, sort of packaged uh, in a way that you can use it in uh, via API is through Azure um, on the, the Microsoft Azure platform. And again, a lot of the stuff is uh, provided by government agencies. Customers are another great source of data. Uh, especially if you can get them to opt in. And the example here is um, that uh, most modern cell phones, mobile devices uh, have a number of sensors and sensors that are um, built into your phone for specific functions that the, uh, the carrier is going to provide can also provide data to applications. And I would encourage you to think about all the different ways those can be, be used. So uh, the barometer, for example, in your iPhone uh, measures altitude. And if you're using a, a health app that tells you how many stairs you've climbed, uh, it's likely that it's, it's reading the information actually from the barometer. But that can also be used for crowdsourced weather reporting. There's just one example, this is um, a weather app that uh, this is from the uh, Dark Sky Company, which is a, their uh, claim to fame is hyperlocal forecasts. And they're able to do that at a finer level of granularity than the National Weather Service or, or some of the other sensor-based things because they have a large um, population of opt-in users that are providing barometric uh, data that they can identify down to, you know, plus or minus a meter. And so by looking at what sources are out there, particularly as uh, more and more IoT sources emerge, uh, you can identify new business opportunities. I mentioned open data. Uh, just a, a couple of more words on that. Most um, most data uh, sets that are produced by government agencies, particularly in the US, 
are made available to the public unless there's a, a privacy or security issue involved uh, in the name of transparency. And most of these are available. Um, sometimes it's fairly crude in terms of what you can get through an API, but uh, everything that, uh, that New York City uh, produces, for example, uh, you can go on to a New York City website and get access to it. In some cases, um, there'll be value added by providers that will just organize it and maybe run it through with um, uh, either a proprietary or, or an open ontology and start to describe some meaning to it and interpretation and then turn that into a feed. But the raw data is there. One of my favorite apps, um, since I spend a lot of time driving in Boston, is one that they uh, developed a few years ago called Street Pump. And this uses the, public, the same data that's available to you. Um, the way it's used here is uh, they have people opt in with an application. And as you're driving around Boston, obviously the app knows where you are. Uh, the GPS in your phone handles that. But by using data from the accelerometer, they can start to map uh, aberrations that are uh, interpreted uh, so that they can understand where there are potholes. That was the original intent. But if you start to think about it and say, okay, well, if I took that data and I took um, weather data from another source, I may be able to uh, create a service that's going to predict um, automobile failures. So it's going to predict a, uh, a demand for ride sharing services. There's all sorts of ways to combine this. But uh, almost every city has something similar where you can get this data. They don't all have something that is using it for, uh, for potholes, but Certainly, they're gathering it for planning, and in most cases, that's available to you. The uh, city of Chicago, another place I've lived in the, my checkered past, uh, has been using sensors to, um, to do a lot of uh, environmental monitoring. Uh, these are placed on, on lampposts. And again, a lot of this is available if you just know that it's being collected, then you can figure out uh, which government agency has it and start to put it to use for your own commercial purposes. And uh, free data um, th that's used uh, by companies like Uber, obviously Uber's not going to just give you their data, but a lot of the data that they, the, the way they're able to provide services is by leveraging a lot of this open data that is available. So it's a combination of that opt-in customer data and um, freely available open data. Location and proximity data, uh, a lot of this is done at the hardware handset level. I just mentioned this, so that, you know, if you're starting to think in terms of uh, applications that would use this data, then you might uh, need to know where it's coming from, and in many cases, it's the ISAT uh, location technologies that are built in to handsets that use the uh, the Qualcomm chipset. So, looking at what you need and what's available, somewhere in there, I think there's usually a good combination. Now, just a, a couple of words of caution. Um, just making the data available, uh, I don't want to get all Heisenberg on you, but uh, just making data available will sometimes change the behavior uh, as more people know about it. And this is an example that I picked up a couple of years ago where um, a lot of side streets that were not tr heavily trafficked in the past uh, have become uh, bottlenecks because applications like Uber are starting to send people down these side streets to get around the, uh, the traffic jams. And so, in some places, people are trying to um, really basically post decoy reports to thwart that routing. And so, it's important that you're able when you're, uh, depending on the, uh, 
the risk associated with your use of data that you know that the data itself um, is, uh, is, is accurate and that you're not dealing with phantoms. Sort of like uh, local hackers uh, trying to influence an election. Here's local hackers trying to influence traffic flow. There's also the issue that uh, I said, you know, you need to think about how, uh, how the companies are modeling things. And it's probably not something that most people give much thought to, but when you have, uh, when you're trying to build an app and you're looking for somebody's location based on their IP address, maybe you're doing political polling, maybe you're doing uh, some other type of forecasting, when some of the uh, services that are providing geolocation based on IP address can't resolve the actual um, address. They have to um, give some address rather than an error. And MaxMind is one place that uh, provides a service and if it can't be resolved, then they default to the center of the region. And in this specific case that uh, came out a couple of years ago, <laughs> um, it was determined that this farmhouse in Kansas was the center of the U.S. and the, uh, the service that was providing the data uh, basically listed it as the home of 600,000 uh, IP addresses. And so a lot of uh, folks that were trying to track down IP, track down the source of some dubious characters based on their IP address. Uh, got the default physical address, and uh, that led to some uncomfortable situations for the homeowners being associated with those 600,000 IP addresses. And it was simply a case of that was the default, and uh, up until the point that, that uh, they ran into legal issues, nobody had thought uh, why that was a, a problem as a default. So if you're depending on the veracity of the data, you need to understand any assumptions that are being made. Uh, one of the interpretation issues is a belief. Uh, something that I, I'm spending a lot of time on right now is looking at um, anonymizing profiles so that we can normalize uh, natural language uh, to the point where uh, you probably all know people who exaggerate or people who underestimate and uh, within your circle of friends, different people saying the same thing, it has different meanings. Well, that's fine if you know the people, but as we, we start to um, build systems that handle natural language, you need to know how they are um, interpreting, interpreting or ascribing meaning if they don't have a large enough sample from an individual. So the, the, the very meaning of words changes by the context, and sometimes that's reflected by the individual that's speaking them. And that's something that uh, uh, we're getting better at, but it, it's an important consideration. Uh, this is an example I, I took from uh, my old psych studies where, uh, and, and it's the same point, just looked at it from a different way, there's a study where they asked uh, children to draw a quarter, and they found a, um, a statistical relationship. Uh, it's an inverse relationship to the income of the family. Children of lower income drew a quarter as a much larger physical coin than uh, people who uh, came from a higher income family. And that sort of reinforces the point that we need to be able to um, in interpreting adjectives and putting that data into a repository, we need to be able to know more about the source. All right, so wrapping it up, most of the data um, that you're going to need for the next generation of applications is already out there, whether it's uh, you know something that is in Wikipedia that you can get from Wikipedia, which uh, you then have to factor in um, things like if it's a uh, house stable has the specific entry bin before you can uh, decide how much um, weight to give it, 
or use uh, one of the systems that takes that from the abstract and makes it more uh, meaningful. Things like uh, natural, natural, National Weather Service. Uh, there's a lot of sources out there. And what I'm going to leave you with today is the idea that it's, you can get um, most types of data through the large uh, cloud services providers via API. You can get a lot of great data from your customers, uh, opt-in or, or otherwise. Uh, I think I mentioned recently a, a case where there's a large retailer that is using uh, heat maps to follow people around the store and they can uh, try and determine whether a group of uh, people is uh, uh, a family unit, in which case they will uh, have one checkout occurrence versus multiple. Um, but there are so many sources out there now. They're being made available uh, publicly uh, via the government, via individuals who are just contributing willingly uh, directly to the Internet of Things, the, the public um, sources, and uh, via sensors, via your, your customers, again, uh, whether it's opt-in and you're getting the sensor data from their phones or it's through another method of monitoring, that uh, there are new opportunities available in all of these areas. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Shannon and see if we have any uh, any questions. Adrian, thank you for another great presentation. If you have any questions for Adrian, submit them in the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, uh, just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording of the session. Everyone's very quiet today, Adrian. Uh, they're showing pity on me for losing my voice. <laughs> Or maybe they're just worried that I'm going to be talking again um, after being so tongue-tied this morning. <laughs> Here we go. We've got a question for you. What is the best way to discover public information available for a specific location or business domain? Um, what's the best way to see what's available? I, I think... Yeah, to, dis what's, uh, to, to discover sure. public information available for a specific location or business domain. Okay. Um, if, you ha if it's something that's collected by the government, most, uh, well, uh, again, speaking of, of the U.S., I can't really address uh, many other places, but almost every city has a website where they list their um, their open data. Uh, I can maybe make a, a list. I won't be able to do a, a comprehensive list uh, that you can send out when you send out the slides, but I can uh, list a couple of samples there. And the federal government, it's generally done by agency. So, for example, if you're interested in air quality, you would go to you know, uh, the EPA site. If you're interested in um, traffic patterns or uh, accidents, things like that, uh, the Department of Transportation would, would do that. There's not one single um, site that has everything. You really sort of need to kind of pick the region and then uh, pick the agency. So, you, you know, for example, it also, um, you know, what's the best way to discover, you know, like California or healthcare or... Um... Um, okay, so it, for California, I would go to, um, you know, one of the, the Sacramento sites. I'll, I'll try and pull that out because I don't have a directory. Um, yeah, those are, obviously it's, it's one question, but it, it's two different answers. So if you're looking at something like healthcare um, and you wanted to limit it to California, then you're going to be dealing with uh, one of the, the Sacramento sites. But if you're looking at healthcare across the U.S., then you would have to look for uh, an agency like Health and Human Services 
uh, and it's going to be all the .gov sites that would have that. I'll see if I can just put together a, a sort of a starting point, and I'll include that uh, when you send out the, the follow-up letter to folks. So, Adrian, what is TCPH and how does it relate to open data? What is... <coughs> I need some context there. Uh, TCPH. You got me on that one. I'm thinking. Um, Mike, do you have a spelling for the acronym? I'm not familiar with yeah. this, this either. One look on. TCPH, no. Okay. Well, let me come back to that. Um, and. And, uh, you know, the, <laughs> the whole, uh, oh, yeah, did you find it was, yeah, I was just wondering if somebody's, uh, it, it's always fun to play stump the analyst. It's the uh, world's largest and most authoritative dictionary database of abbreviations and acronyms. How about that? Oh, there you go. <laughs> you got me there. Well, and, you know, hot in the news today, it, you know, this week especially, you know, it's been Facebook um, in the last couple of weeks, you know. Mm -hmm. Can you come out on this topic in relation to the uh, Zuckerman context? Sure, sure. Um, can I have another hour? Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the shortest thing I can say on that is it was interesting to me. I just assume that everything is being – monitored the question is what's being done with it afterwards and zuckerberg's testimony was he was being very emphatic that they didn't sell the data about individuals to companies uh, what they actually sold was access to people based on the data so if i wanted to do something uh, and, and target a specific group i couldn't say give me the list of people that fall into this um, this set. Uh, give me the, the people that are 21 to 35 in Chicago, um, specific race, religion, et cetera. But I could say that that was a group of interest and I want to send those people this message. So they held on to the personally identifiable information or that's the, the um, the claim, um, but to me, that's to some extent a distinction without a difference. It's they have the information, they've captured the information, and they're providing that as a service, if you will, rather than providing the data. And that's, that's kind of a distinction that uh, maybe I should have made when I was talking about some of these um, data sources. For the most part, uh, the sources that are um, commercially available, like the list that you, I had on uh, on Google and other providers have them too, like Dow Jones, for example. That data is provided as a service. The distinction is the other types of data you can download and then you have, uh, in, in many cases, free use to, uh, to build on it, but it's, it's not something that you own. With Zuckerberg and Facebook, what they're saying is that they own that data about you and they can uh, provide access to that subgroup based on it, but they won't give or sell that data. All right. Well, Adrian, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you for another great presentation, and thanks to everybody for uh, being engaged in so everything we do. Um, I will again will send a follow up email by end of day Monday for this with links to the slides and links to the recording. And Adrian, I'll send you over the additional questions that we didn't have time to get to there um, and comment. Thanks. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much. Hope you have a great day. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks. Take care.